Galatians chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, we will have the text up on the screens behind me in just a moment. Uh, we also have some physical Bibles scattered around the room, little racks uh, beneath the seats. And so if you don't own a Bible of your very own, don't have one that you can call yours, we invite you to take that physical one home. Uh, the reason for that is incredibly simple. We believe that God uses his word to teach us about himself, period. Like there's a bunch of other really awesome things that God does with the Bible and around the Bible and through the Bible, but that's the thing that he does with the Bible. He teaches us about himself. And listen, we kind of like for real want you to know God. We want everything in and about and around your life to be shaped by that knowing of him. And so if you don't have one that you can call your own, I can point you to lots of free options, like digital options, but we also have some physical ones to give away. Uh, and so if you don't have one, take that one. I'll call it the greatest part of my day. All right, so uh, I want to start something new this morning. Uh, we're kicking off a brand new series that we're calling Fruit. And we got artwork for it. Garrett did it as usual. It looks really pretty. It's always better when he does it instead of when I do it. All right. Um, and so uh, we, we got this, this kind of cool little series going on. We even got some fruit down here under the thing. We're trying to be cute about it. All those kinds of things. All right. But it's the tagline of the series that I really want us to kind of dig into and just kind of grab a hold of and, and kind of flesh out throughout the course of this series. What God's people look like. If that question were asked of you, if you were put on the spot and someone said, all right, all right, tell me what God's people look like, what's the answer you're going with? How do you, how do you answer that question? What would be the characteristics that defined us? I think probably most of us, at least those of us who have a more churched background, spend a good bit of time in here, I, I think the top shelf answer that we're immediately going to come with is those who have placed their faith in the finished work of Jesus to make payment for our sin, period. That is the definition of what God's people look like. Those who have trusted in the finished work of Jesus on the cross to make payment for their sin and are now reconciled to God forever. Boom. So, does that mean the series is over? Just close our Bibles and go home? It is the best answer. But can that answer be fleshed out anymore? Can we, can we grab a hold of some nuance and try to swirl it around and figure out some things? I think so. While God is saving people from every tribe, tongue, and language, and while he's even people in this room that are coming from dramatically different socioeconomic backgrounds, education levels, skin colors, all those things. God is definitely gathering an incredibly eclectic church that's united by this core identity of saved by grace through faith. The Bible also teaches that the longer that we walk with Jesus, the more he changes us into something new. The more he turns us into something that's different than what we came out of. And so it's that new Jesus-given identity that I want to try to flesh out throughout the course of this series. I want to try to grab a hold of that. And so to do that, I think we need to start in a place that all the good church kids know where to turn when we see a series called Fruit, Galatians chapter 5. Um, so what's the context of Galatians chapter 5? So the churches in Galatia are dealing with a problem. They're wrestling with some theological problems. Some bad guys have crept into the church and have begun teaching some less than biblical things. All right? uh, they, they've started to kind of pick away at some the foundations that were left by Paul and other guys. Namely, that while Jesus is great and all, and his grace is really awesome, I want me some more of that, what you really need is to supplement that good gift of God with a little self-made effort. What you really need is to kind of make God happy with just a little bit of cleaning yourselves up and following the Jewish law. Things like the ceremonial washings and the, the dietary restrictions and even circumcision. All right? The marking on Jewish men to, as a sign of the Old Testament covenant. And they, were, they were physically marked as God's chosen people, right? And so this group came in, and, and so they're often called the Judaizers. This group came in, and because they were kind of forcing people to ascribe, Gentile Christians to ascribe to Jewish customs, all under the guise that if you finally do these things, God will be extra happy with you. And so they would never they would never say that Jesus and his work on the cross weren't important. Surely, obviously it's important. Clearly it's a big deal, but I mean that was just the first step. 
You need all these other steps too. If you really want to make God happy, you'll do all this other stuff over here too. And so, I, I mean, we're, we're really excited that Jesus kind of kick-started our righteousness for us. But if you really want to move beyond God just simply tolerating you and into the category of God really being pleased with you, you would add X, Y, and Z to your to-do list. That's the the thing that's being taught throughout the Galatian churches. And so the letter of Galatians exists because Paul finds out about this and he goes off. He doesn't want anything to, this isn't going to last long now that Paul's aware of the situation. And so I love Galatians because it's long been the most favorite letter of all the hotheads in the church. Paul just tears into them. All right, so the third paragraph of the letter, Paul gives two paragraphs to a quick little greeting. And then the third paragraph of the letter, he launches right into them. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Jesus lays into him at the outset. In other words, we're not playing around with second tier doctrines here. Confusing this issue is actually confusing the gospel. And so all throughout the book of Galatians, Paul's going to consistently over and over again attack the idea that any, any man-made effort of ours can do anything other than lead to death. He's going to absolutely tear into that idea to which the Judaizers, the bad guys in Galatia, would say, well, of course of course, we, we're not strong enough. We needed Jesus to get us started. We were weak-willed and separated from God, right? But now that we are reconciled, now that we are saved, it's our responsibility to maintain, they would say. God has saved us by his grace, sure, but it's our responsibility to stay in those good graces by finally fulfilling the rest of the law by our own strength. God has, God has kicked us off and, and made us capable, and now it's our turn to carry the torch. It's our turn to keep the plates spinning. To which Paul, in Galatians chapter 3, will come back and say, Oh, you foolish Galatians. Who's bewitched you? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Meaning, are you really, seriously, so silly as to believe that the Spirit is incapable of getting you all the way there? You you, you really going to stand there and try to tell me that you believe that God desperately needs your help in order to close this all out? They got sitting around going, I'm not sure I can pull this off. Let's call in another. He's not strong enough to accomplish all this. It got through a pretty strong seven innings, but I guess it's time to call the bullpen and, bring in, and close this game out, right? Call in the big money arm. And I get that that sounds like a ridiculous scenario. I get that. But at the same time, this is also a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel that is still held by a lot of groups that call themselves Christians today. Verbatim. This is the official understanding of the gospel as taught by the Catholic Church. Now, that may not be what you heard from your local parish, but it is official catechism-level teaching. Paragraph 2027, if you're interested. This is not just a Catholic thing, though. It's also the official understanding of the gospel as taught by Mormons. Do all we can, and then God covers the rest. And while they don't have official stances on things, they're not exactly organized people, but this is the understanding that's often taught by the perfectionist movement within Pentecostalism. Because I'm saved, I'm now supposed to be capable of perfectly fulfilling God's law. Jesus graciously got me started, but now it's my job to keep the plates spinning. But not only does this idea, I think, grossly mischaracterize who God is and how he's saving us, church family, I also think it grossly mischaracterizes our own heart. Grossly mischaracterizes it. It completely oversells our ability to try and perfect our own righteousness. See, while, while everybody else is hustling, trying their absolute best to to make sure that everyone around them sees that they're keeping the plate spinning. It's no problem at all. I'm doing just fine, honestly. What no one ever says out loud is how terribly exhausting it all is. 
We never tell the stories of how often it blows up in our face. Or, or it ends up producing a people who wait until certain others are not looking and then they take the plates down for a while. That doesn't exist in our world at all, does it? And all that effort, all that really righteous sounding effort, it results in a spiritual slavery that's no fundamentally different than the slavery that they were supposedly saved out of. And so in the beginning of Galatians chapter 5, Paul says it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery, a system of slavery, a burden of slavery. So here's the million-dollar question, I think. I mean, we got this new relationship, won for us by the finished work of Jesus on the cross, but we've also got hearts and habits that don't look anything at all like the Jesus who supposedly saved us and we now belong to. So we've got a disconnect there. We love him and we want to look like him. In fact, we've even been commanded to look like him. First Peter 1, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Anybody doing well on that one? I mean, it sounds important. The problem, though, is that I don't see a lot of intrinsically holy things in me. Because of Jesus' sacrificial death to make payment for our sin, we have been declared holy. We've been declared holy. We be- belong to him. We are clothed in his righteousness. We've been declared holy. And so we are holy in a judicial sense, but we are not yet holy in a functional sense. My attitudes and actions, my heart stances and worldviews don't always look like what he's called them to look like. So how can we possibly, possibly get there? Like, I'm not strong enough. Are you strong enough? I'm not strong enough. So how in the world do we move from point A to to point B? How can we possibly grow in righteousness when when our own flesh seems to be totally incapable of actually pulling that off? Galatians chapter 5. Paul might have an answer for us. He says this in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. All right, so Paul says, walk by the Spirit. Okay, how do you do that? Right? How in the world do you do that? What does that mean? It means... And we think and we live in such a way that we are guided by the Spirit living in us rather than what we naturally are. The Spirit and our flesh, they run in opposite directions, verse 17 says. They're opposed to each other. And so in that moment, when you've got a choice in front of you, when you... You can either do what comes natural to you or you can do what you're learning that the Spirit values. That that in that moment you consciously pick what the Spirit values and then in that moment you will take a step towards a functional righteousness that matches what more closely your already declared righteousness. You will look a little more consistently holy to go along with the holy title that has already been graciously gifted to you by Jesus. Oh, okay. I, I mean, that sounds like a really, I don't know, long, slow, painfully slow even uh, process of growth. Uh, is, isn't there a faster track than that? No. Nope. Um, it, it, it is really, really slow. In fact, I'll, I'll go ahead and give you the bad news up front. It's going to take the rest of your life. Have fun. It's going to take the rest of your life. Until Jesus calls you home, he's going to continue working on you. 
Day after day, even minute after minute, you're going to wrestle with this stuff until Jesus says, all right, you're done. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I, but I'm pretty, pretty new at this stuff still, and I'm, I'm just, just between you and me, I'm still kind of learning to understand what the Spirit values. I'm still trying to learn what His voice sounds like. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I may be a few more years down the road than you are on that one, but yeah, I'm in the same boat. It's hard sometimes. I don't always get it right. Those who know me well know I don't always get it right. And <laughs> just, just between you, me, and the internet, there are some times that, that I get so frustrated I want to throw my hands up and just walk away and do things by my own power. Anybody else? But in that moment, the question to be answered is really simple. How does doing things in my own power usually end up? <laughs> Very poorly is the answer. It never, ever goes well. I can, I can ask that question a, a different way. Has anything that I have ever tried to make happen by my own strength produced anywhere near as much spiritual growth in me as that slow, sometimes frustrating work of the Spirit? Not even close. Not even close. And why is that? Well, because the works of the flesh run the, the opposite direction. My effort is heading in the wrong way. Look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says, hey, we all know what our flesh ends up producing, self-infatuated sin. And then he lists off a bunch of ways that that sinful heart stance kind of fleshes itself out, dropping words like sorcery and orgies in the middle of church. Can he do that? Paul did. And if you happen to be one of those, you know, I can do this myself types, this list might offend you a little bit. I'm just going to guess. I'm sure there are some of you who are very proud that all your self-made effort has never resulted in anything outlandish as sorcery and orgies. But I am willing to bet that you can point to countless times in your life where it's resulted in envy and in jealousy, where it's resulted in anger and division. And even if you don't know what dissensions means, there's probably some of that in there too. Google it later. But I can, I can push here too. I'm also willing to bet that that self-made streak in you has probably caused more sexual immorality than you'd like to admit to in public. Why? Because the desire to control will always bleed out into misusing the good things that God has given you. Always. It's inevitable. It's just a ticking time bomb. It's coming. Self-made managers will always end up trying to manage their sin as well. And so when you, when you try to, to play God, you will never <laughs> take long before you, you end up corrupting his design in order to make something out of yourself and exalt yourself. It's just a little further down the road than where you're at. Whether we're talking food, money, sex, work, play, it doesn't matter. Whether we're talking the religious type or the anti-religious type, it doesn't matter. The works of the flesh always have the exact same core problem. You. You are the common denominator in your sin. You. Works of the flesh are evident, Paul says. We all know what they are. We know exactly what they are when we see them. We may lie to ourselves for a little while, but if we take an honest step back and judge ourselves and our experience correctly, we will see the pattern for what it truly is. It's there. And so, looking more and more like Jesus, it can never, and I mean ever, 
come by our own effort and strength. In fact, left to our own effort and strength, we would have no hope of inheriting the kingdom at all. But thanks be to God, that's not where he left us. Look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Hey, it's that part of Galatians 5 that most everybody knows, right? The fruit of the Spirit. Woo! If you didn't put the pieces together before, this is why we named the series what we did. Congratulations, you're now at the head of the class. All right, so if you grew up in church, you likely have this list memorized and, and, I can probably guess how old you are based on whether you quote it in the King James or the NIV. Just say it. Some of us have hidden talents. That's one of mine. All right. Paul, says, Paul says that for those walking in the Spirit, the Spirit produces certain fruit in your life. And, and then he lists off nine different things. All right, so now we're going to spend the next nine weeks after today digging into each and every one of these things. We're going to spend a week highlighting each one of them. So I'm not going to spend much time talking about them today. Uh, but um, there are some things as in the entirety of the list that probably needs to be pointed out. The list as a group that we need to kind of flesh out. And probably, I would think, the, the biggest and most important thing to point out in, is that all of these fruit are really nothing more than the fleshing out of God's own good character. You ever thought through that? In other words... God is already each of these things in perfection. I know we say it on a regular basis around here, but we have to say it on a regular basis because we live in a culture that seems to try to assume the exact opposite of God in the Bible and the church. But hear me clearly. God does not call you to anything that he is not already doing himself. I'll say that again because it matters. God does not call you to anything that he's not already doing himself. Whether it's his commands or the things he's growing you in, he is the initiator that calls you to join him where he is. It's not simply be holy because uh, holy people make me look really good. No, it's be holy as I am holy, right? It's not go to others and tell them about Jesus because, you know, I want some more people to know me. It's no, I have come to you, so now you go to others. It's love as I have first loved you. It's I have washed your feet, so you also ought to wash one another's feet over and over and over and over again throughout the entirety of the Bible. This is the trajectory that God works. And so growing in love, growing in peace, growing in goodness are not nice little character traits that, you know, the kind of people that God wants to be on his team, give God a good reputation in the world. No, they are the character traits that will most accurately reflect who God is to the world. It's a matter of getting our theology correct and properly telling the story of who it is that has saved us. When God's people grow in these things, those around us get a more faithful depiction of who God is. Which sadly also means that the alternative is true. When we're not growing in these things, the world gets a very wrong impression of who he is. This is the kind of place where we can be honest. I, sometimes the hardest work of evangelism is undoing bad ideas produced by bad examples. Sometimes that's the mountain you got to climb before someone will come to meet Jesus. You got to undo the baggage. Thanks be to God, though, man. Not, not only for the cross, because like, like our failure in that is one of the sins that are paid for in full. But also... Thanks be to God because he is big enough to call people to himself in spite of our sometimes insufficient example. He uses us. He doesn't need us. He's good to us. And his aim is to day after day make us look more and more and more and more like himself. What else can we point out about our complete list of fruit. Well, every good pastor teaching this text is going to eventually make you look back at verse 22 again. So look at verse 22 again. All right, what does it say? 
and the what? The fruit. All right, let's focus on fruit for a second. Is that word singular or plural? Singular. It's singular. Singular in the Greek, too. That seems weird. Why, 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 why would Paul do that? Does Paul not know how to spell things? Does he not know that we need, there's multiple fruit there. Why wouldn't he use the plural word? Well, it's because this isn't some a la carte menu. And we might pick and choose to add to our personality at different times and different seasons. Well, you know, I, I really want to be, be, be more joy-filled and, you know, just kind of kind this year. Eh, go ahead and throw in some gentleness too. I can handle that. Can I go ahead and put in an order of faithfulness for all my friends? That's not what's going on here. You know, you know the fact that Paul uses the singular word for fruit here, it tells us that these traits grow together together in a person who is becoming more and more and more like the Spirit. And so as you walk in the Spirit, all of these things are growing in you at the same time. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that all of these things exist in equal measure in a person. Maybe personality-wise, before Jesus saved you, you had a lot of self-control but very little patience. Anybody else know somebody like that? <laughs> but as you've walked in the Spirit, both of those things have grown in a more Christ-like shape. Both of them. So by God's grace, you are more patient today than when Jesus first called you to himself. But you're also more gentle, and you're also more loving, and you're also more this and that. And so if a fruit tree is producing on just a couple of branches while all the other branches are barren, that tree's got a problem, right? That tree is unhealthy, in the same way, if, if all the other branches are producing fruit, but one branch is clearly not, that branch is about to get chopped off. It's the problem. And so, starting next week, we're, we're going to begin looking at each of these fruit in turn. We're going to highlight and spend our time kind of digging into each one of them separately. But the danger that we need to guard ourselves from as we walk through this series is falling into the trap of believing that, well, you know, we're, we're good at some things and maybe not so good at some other things, and I'll probably need to just work on this one, and, but these things are fine. You know that kind of idea? There's these, there's these couple of things that I really need to grow in, but I'm so thankful that these things are going well. We have been called and we are being called to grow in all of these fruit together. Whenever we try to answer the question, what do God's people look like? The answer is all of these things. All of them. So these fruit are an outworking of God's own character and his people. They're, they come as a packaged group. What else can we learn from the list? I think it's also very, very important to point out who the fruit belonged to. Paul does not say that these things are the fruit you produce by choosing to walk in the Spirit. No, he says that these are fruit of the Spirit himself. Meaning, this isn't some cause and effect formula that, you know, you can kind of manage for your own personal growth goals. Uh, no, no you, if you take, make sure to take steps A, then B, then C in that proper sequence, and then you'll, you'll, be, then you'll be on the way to finally reaching your fully realized spiritual maturity Potential? I, I don't know. That, I started saying something and then I didn't figure out how to end it. All right, so do this, do that, and then you'll be growing. You'll reach maturity, right? Watch out, world. Now, this is the fruit that the Spirit produces in you as you walk with Him, which means you have no power to produce this fruit yourself. You can't pull this off. Dig in a little deeper, invest a little harder, make sure I'm more disciplined in this area, and then therefore, growth, baby. I'm an entrepreneur. I can figure this one out. You are on the receiving end of a changing work being done in you. In you. There's no such thing as a self-propelled fast track to spiritual maturity. 
Maturity is being produced in you by the Spirit. So, so does that mean that we're just waiting around, sitting there, doing nothing, hoping that God will one day make us mature people? No. I mean, that does sound kind of lazy when you say it that way, but, well, that's where verse 24 comes into play. Look at that. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have what? Crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The one who walks in the Spirit, patiently waiting for God to produce fruit, they do not, hear me, they do not sit around and do nothing. You may not be able to make the fruit grow on the tree, but you can do things that create a healthy environment for that tree to flourish. You can do simple things to protect that tree from enemies that would seek to harm the tree. And so Paul says here that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, they have put to death the flesh with its passions and desires. So what in the world does that mean? Well, it means in that moment that we talked about earlier, that moment when you've got a a choice in front of you where you can either choose to, to pick what comes natural to you or you can choose to pick what you're learning that the Spirit values more. And so in that moment, it's more than just a calculated return on your investments. Well, this one over here promises a greater reward, so I guess I'll choose that one. It's not less than that, but it's also incredibly more than that. It's so not in, in this moment, it's a moment that's just as much about where you call what comes naturally to you exactly what it is. Something that leads to death. Something that robs you of greater joy. Something that stands in the way of the new passions and desires that Jesus is giving to you. And in that moment, you don't just make a better choice. No, you look at that other option and you say, no, thank you. I don't want you anymore. Be gone, you sad little petty excuse at joy. I'd rather have Jesus. You're dead to me. I'd rather have what Jesus offers. It's not just a, this one provides me a greater return. I, you're harmful to me. I don't want you. Move. Give me Jesus. Paul says that those who belong to Jesus make regular work of killing off the old them. That as Jesus changes your heart to love what he loves, you act on that love by putting distance between yourself and that which stands in the way of an infinitely better joy. And church family, this this is why when you start thinking about second and third tier things, this is why dealing with sin is ultimately an incredibly important marker for spiritual growth. It's, It's not... Hear me clearly. It is not because we've been called to white-knuckle our way into anything. It's because clinging to sin kind of lets everybody watching you know that you'd rather have that sin than Jesus. That's the issue. It's an affections problem. And everybody watching you sees it for what it is. Doesn't mean that Letting go of that sin is an easy process. doesn't mean that there aren't real things like addictions. In some cases, it very well may be that thing that you wrestle with and distance yourself from, crucify for the rest of your life. It very well might be. But either Jesus is better than that thing or he ain't. Either Jesus is better than that thing or he's not better than that thing. So Paul, he lines out a bunch of fruit that the Spirit grows in his people, and he does so in a way that both acknowledges our role and our desperate need for the Spirit to work on our behalf, in our place. But how does that play out on a church level? Like, I think we see a little bit of that in the next verse. Look at verse 25. Paul says, If we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So Paul returns to this kind of walking language that he introduced at the beginning of verse 16, right? But now, now there's a community context buried in it. 
There's an assumption that this is happening in and around other people. And so and he, he speaks to this issue in, in a negative sense, clearly. Avoid being conceited, avoid provoking, avoid envy. And so, but that sounds an awful lot like the, the list of works of the flesh that we saw earlier, right? Back in verse 19. Sounds an awful lot like that. And so it would seem to me, this is my theory here, it would seem to me that the positive way of phrasing the exact same thought is to say that the fruit of the Spirit has a community dynamic as well. That the Spirit's fruit produces good things within the life of the church, not just the individual. That's not exactly hard to believe, right? Spirit, spiritual maturity in God's people ends up being a blessing to everyone else around them. Like, we all kind of get that. It's not just fruit that, that you benefit from, it's fruit that everyone benefits from. The fruit ends up being a blessing to everyone else. And so, listen, I'm, I'm excited about where this series is headed for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons I'm really excited about this series is because I think it's pretty easy to see how this stuff will pay long-term benefits down the road for us. It's not merely, hey, let's all get a little bit more spiritually mature. No, I, I think our church will be blessed by this. I think we can't help but be matured and strengthened in all these things by this. These are the, the kinds of things that Every little step of growth produces multiple layers of blessing for us. But, but what do we do with it today, right? I mean, we got, we got down the road ideas, but what do we do with it today? How can we respond to God this morning? Well, if you're here this morning and you're already a follower of Jesus, our response, like always, is to repent of sin and to, to lean into what God is revealing about himself in the text. And this week, man, I think, I think we get to rest in the fact that God doesn't just save us past tense. He is also saving us present tense. He is faithful and good, and he is working all things to shape us into who he wants us to be. And that's really good news for me. Because I know me. I don't know about you, but I need, need God to walk with me through this process instead of just dropping me off saying, good luck, boy. I wouldn't fare well. I don't want him to lead me to my own devices. I know what my own devices produce. Thanks be to God, he has, infinite, he has an infinitely bigger plan for me than just dropping us off and wishing us luck. That is not his game plan. And so while, while we've got some cultivating work to do, we're called to rest in the big stuff. That's a lot less exhausting than the other options. I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. That's a time we set aside to put action to whatever God might be stirring in your heart this morning. Maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you need to respond in some other kind of way. Maybe it's to formally join our church family or maybe it's time to be obedient to Jesus' command to be baptized or maybe maybe it's time to finally say yes to the, God, the call that God's putting on your heart to take the gospel to some faraway other place. Maybe that's you this morning. I'd love to talk to you. What if you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus yet? How can, how can you respond? The answer is simple. You, you, your, your response is to meet Jesus. To meet Jesus. The Bible teaches that all people by default are separated from God relationally because of our sin. That we are owed the righteous and just punishment for that sin. The Bible calls it death. But the Bible also teaches it is by grace through faith that we are saved. That even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, God makes us alive by Christ, by his, uh, through Christ by his grace. So how does he do that? God sent his son. You've heard the story. Jesus put on flesh and he dwelt among us. He lived uh, the sinless life that I am clearly not capable of living. And he died on the cross as a perfectly innocent substitute in my place to make payment for my sin. He rose again from the dead as a vindication of his perfect and sufficient righteousness. And now is the one who stands as king conquered sin and death, he calls on you in this very moment to respond to him in repentance and in faith. What is that? Those are big churchy words. What, is that, what does that mean? Well, repentance is to turn. Faith is to trust. So you turn from your sin and you trust in Jesus instead. You can do that this morning. I'd love to be helpful to you. I gotta play another song, but man, we can talk after we're done. I'd love to help you make sense of what that response of saving faith looks like. But whoever you are, 
however God is calling you to respond this morning. Let's all respond together right now. Father, you're good to us. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for being the God who not only is perfectly holy and good and righteous in all these things, but desires to turn us into those who look more and more like you. And I know my heart, I know how far I have to go on that. I know that there are a thousand things that seem to stand in the way. But you are faithful, and you are good, and not only are you mighty to save, you are mighty to continue saving. So God, as we dig into the series, as we dig into all these things about who we are as your people, would you... Do you give us strength to actually walk with you? There are more times that I'm weak than I'm even paying attention to. But you provide for even that. I need it. Father, for those here who don't know you yet, would you make yourself known this morning? Would you open eyes to see and ears to hear, hearts to know you? Will we be forever changed by you today? As we sing... Do something in our response. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray.